Uh, good afternoon, um, everyone. Uh, my name is Eva Twalkowski. I'm from Hunter Local Land Services. I'm the Community Engagement Officer uh, for the Hunter region. And um, I'd like to welcome you all uh, to our second live stream work, work, workshop series, um, Who is Living on My Land? Uh, this um, program, this uh, three-month wildlife uh, camera monitoring program uh, was um, undertaken uh, at the end of last year and um, across this was across uh, a number of different properties in the Lower Hunter and Upper Hunter uh, regions. Uh, today's uh, workshop uh, will be presenting the findings of, of the monitoring program which focuses on uh, capturing ver vertebrate pest species uh, as well as native, uh, native wildlife. Uh, mostly on uh, peri-urban in within peri-urban areas, or those small um, small landholder on small landholders on properties. Um, this inf this data has this data will help inform appropriate um, feral animal uh, management management control, and hopefully encourage uh, people to undertake uh, a coordinated approach to feral animal control in their in their region. Uh, this um, wildlife camera monitoring program is also part of a larger program uh, which is called the Every Bit Counts uh, program uh, and that, um, that, that involves a number of different coastal uh, local land services regions uh, and, and this program aims to connect small landholders and, um, and develop, uh, develop tailored workshops and events um, to, sp to support a diverse range of agricultural activities in the region. So today's workshop um, will include a number of um, presentations um, uh, undertaken, which will include uh, a presentation by Rosemary Rural from Rural, Rural and Environmental Management, uh, and uh, Rosemary will provide an overview of uh, the, the results from the monitoring um, program. Uh, Cairo O'Brien from Local Land Services, um, our biosecurity officer, she'll also provide an overview of um, the biosecurity uh, legislation and current programs uh, and events that are being undertaken, uh, particularly in the, in the Torrey Burn Gressford areas. Uh, there will also be feral animal control demonstrations uh, and there will be a question and answer session at, at, the, at the end of each um, presentation. Um, uh, this, uh, this workshop can also be viewed um, after the live stream session. Uh, and, um, and just a reminder that this is this is a uh, uh, this is live and, and and an interactive session. So we really encourage you to send through your comments and um, your questions uh, throughout the workshop, and uh, and we'll also um, uh, an answer any of those questions at the end of every um, presentation. Uh, so I'd like to now um, in, invite Rosemary uh, to to do her presentation.
Good afternoon, I'm Rosemary Raw. I'm part owner and environmental manager at Rural and Environmental Management. Um, this afternoon, um, I am going to just present the results or the findings of the Strategic Game Camera Monitoring Program our company undertook on behalf of local land services. But before I do that, I'd just like to um, say I hope that you and your families are safe, healthy and well in this COVID-19 situation we find ourselves in. And um, I hope that you're enjoying your beautiful properties um, where we establish these cameras and um, uh, keeping all those social distancing requirements. So, um, the Vertebrae Press Strategic Game Camera Monitoring Program was undertaken on behalf of Hunter Local Land Services between September and December 2019. And just to give you a, a quick cap of the presentation topics, so you can kind of see where this um, presentation's um, moving to, I thought I'd just run through the topics I'm going to cover. So the first will be an introduction. Um, to the program. The second will be the areas that we covered, all the locations covered across the Hunter. The third is the methodology that we um, implemented to undertake the program. The fourth is just the positioning of the cameras and how we undertook this, just in case you're interested in setting up cameras on your property again. The next is basically the presentation of the overall results of the program. I'm going to provide a brief discussion on those overall results and then we're going to hone in on the results for your local area. Um, that's for the Gressford, Torryburn area this afternoon. And following that we'll just wrap up with the re recommendations that Rural and Environmental Management came up with as a result of the results um, of the program out in the field. So. In just introducing the program, I know that most of you participated in the program, but Hunter Local Land uh, Services engaged REM to establish a strategic game monitoring program to basically monitor um, the presence of pest animals as well as um, native animals out on your property but it was all as a result of um, the Hunter Regional Strategic Pest Animal um, Management Plan 2018 to 2023. So in consultation with Hunter Local Land Services, um, locations containing private land between two and, ten, uh, two and 10 hectares and then 10 to 20 hectares were, um, I suppose, highlighted and on the peri-urban interface across the Hunter region. Um, they were chosen based on the presence of threatened species and also endangered ecological communities. And they tried to align choosing the various locations um, that align with national land care programs and also catchment action programs that were being undertaken. Uh, peri-urban areas were targeted, um, once again, land between 2 and 20 hectares um, that are kind of too small for traditional vertebrate pest management um, programs to be undertaken and that are kind of outside the urban build-up or residential build-up areas where domestic animals are dealt with by local council. Um, the parcels of land in these peri-urban areas Although productive, in most cases aren't large enough to generate a full income, thus property owners are not inclined to cull pests due to limited time, because usually people have full-time jobs, um, limited expertise in the area, and further, they're not likely to be trying to protect an agricultural income. Um, these parcels of land fall into a kind of grey zone 
where, as I said, they're too small for local land services to assist in the traditional vertebrae pest management techniques that are used on larger rural properties, and they fall outside of um, local council sc um, scope. So that is, council ranges are usually dealing with domestic cats and dogs, as opposed to, you know, the wild feral um, dogs, um, feral cats and foxes. So now we'll just move to the areas covered by the program. Um, Hunter Local Land Services identified 20, 27 suitable game camera locations in priority peri-urban peri areas across the Hunter region. Um, in the, the 2 to 10 hectare um, land size as well as the 10 to 20 property holdings. The cameras were divided into four zones across the um, lower and mid hunter area um, and they consisted of one the broke milbradale area two the east gresford torryburn area three the greeter oswald brankston harpers hill and lincolnfield area and finally the eagleton shortland and maryland area the next um well, the first figure kind of up in front of you now, just highlights the overall program area that was captured in the program. You'll see that all the blue triangles um, on the map identify the areas where um, the property or the um, monitoring program was undertaken. So as far north as um, East Grisbane, um, as far southeast as Shortland and Maryland, and Right out to the west, we have broken the Milbradale area. Right in the centre, we have the Oswald, Greeter, Lincolnfield and Brankston area that was covered. Um, these next couple of slides basically highlight or zoom in on each particular area. So the first area is the broke Milbradale area. There were six properties that were included in um, the project or program. The East Gresford and Torryburn area, um, four properties were um, included in the program. The Greeter, Brankston and Lincolnfield area, there were nine properties in total. And in these areas, well, this area particular, particularly, you can see just those, all those peri-urban areas are just on the outskirts of the built-up residential zones of Greeter, Brankston and East uh, Brankston. And um, here we have the Eagleton area. There were six properties that participated in the program in the Eagleton area. And finally, we had two properties in the Shortland, Maryland area um, that were included just because of their um, size and their reference to the build-up urban areas of, I suppose, the outer um, Newcastle area. So I'll just move on to the methodology that we used. 28 motion sensor cameras were established in stages across the 27 locations or your 27 properties in the Hunter region. Sites were chosen based on optimal areas to study in peri-urban interface and also landholder interests. So thanks very much for allowing us to come out and set up the cameras. There were four types of motion sensor cameras utilised um, and they included scout guard and bulvard scouting trail cameras. They ranged from five megapixels right through to 16 megapixels. So our methodology included um, GPSing all the locations and these were taken as a reference when the cameras were established and also so we could go find our cameras um, throughout the program. The cameras um, and the SD memory cards were all labelled with unique identities. That was so um, we could cross-reference that data when we were taking it back to the office and going through all the results. 
Cameras were periodically checked over the 16 week period. Um, the, camera was, the cameras were established um, initially and after a one week um, period in the field, we went back out just to check that the cameras were capturing um, data that we were after. Um, and if we found that the cameras weren't capturing you know, the vertebrae pests that we were looking to obtain, they were just relocated and repositioned. Um, once we'd collected the data out in the field or the SD cards, they were basically reviewed and the species of fauna that were recorded were categorised according to whether they were vertebrae pests or feral animals, whether they were native animals and finally there was one other category which was other for domestic pets and animals. So if we saw, um, you know, one of your pet dogs, that was put into the other. If we saw that um, anyone was horse riding, those were obviously put into um, the other category. So the next slide basically just shows you a up close of a camera that um, would have been used out on your property or out in the field. And the um, picture to the right, um, which might be a little difficult to see, um, illustrates our camera or one of the cameras um, positioned out in the field. It's quite camouflaged and um, um, blends in quite well, which is um, helpful. I'm just going to now um, run through the positioning of um, how, how we position cameras out in the field. The following guidelines were used um, on the participating properties. Uh, we preferably chose a location where we knew that there was animal activity. You ideally locate the camera at the end junction or facing um, a mid-animal track just to ensure that you're likely to pick up um, the pest animal um, on route through the property. You can set up the camera on a tree or a post basically between knee and waist height from the ground which is approximately one metre. The height will target the majority of mid-range pests, for example cats and foxes, and it'll also um, get the larger size mammals, um, in this case like a deer or pig. Um, we use secretaries, uh, secretaires to cut any grass, twigs or branches that may be in front of the camera on, that may obscure photos or trigger um, the sensor unintentionally. Well, we ensure that the camera is upright and secured to the tree or post with the strap that's usually provided. We undertook a test um, at approximately three metres distance just to ensure the region of interest is as expected and we're getting a good view. Um, you can use a stick or similar to prop behind the camera to align it if necessary. Um, there's the option of camouflaging the camera with like additional paint, leaves, twigs or bark. Um, this is useful in build up areas where, you know, it's a public space or reserve where um, people might be inclined to take your camera if, um, if they're walking through. Um, to avoid potential force triggers um, due to temperature and motion disturbances, it's worthwhile avoiding aiming the camera directly at a heat source, such as a sun heated stone or metal. So this next, uh, or the first table in this presentation, summarises the pest or vertebrae pests that um, were identified. Um, in that left-hand column, um, we, this basically summarises what was found. We had wild dogs, foxes, wild deer, feral cats, wild rabbits, European hares and Indian minor birds. Native fauna, on the other hand, or in the other column, included kangaroos and wallabies, possums, both ringtail and brushtail, native birds, echidnas, common wombats, lizards, including both bearded dragon and lace monitors, 
we had bats and um, koala. A koala was also identified. It wasn't actually um, captured on our camera, but the week that we collected the camera in the field, koalas were observed um, on one of the properties that we had a camera set up on. So I thought it was worthwhile including. So this first graph basically illustrates the overall results of the um, game camera monitoring program. You'll see down along the base of the graph, it basically numbers all the different properties that participated, so 1 through to 27. And on that left-hand side, it just um, gives you the number of pest animal species identified. So, 92% of the properties actually recorded at least one vertebrate pest. Um, 19 out of the 27 properties um, had foxes captured on the camera, followed by 10 out of the 27 properties um, capturing either feral or stray cats. The next highest captured um, pest was hares and rabbits combined. Nine out of 27 properties had these. Um, the deer were the next um, highly captured number, um, highly captured um, pest, recorded on six out of the 27 properties. Wild dogs, um, we had three um, properties capture wild dogs on their cameras and finally we had just one property with um, Indian miners captured on on camera. The next graph I've, um, that is presented um, shows the native fauna that was captured on the cameras. So every single property had um, at least one native animal caught on the um, camera on their property. And you'll see that um, nine out of the 27 properties had kangaroos or wallabies. Um, 19 out of the 27 um, properties had birds of um, one type or another. 10 properties out of the 27 had possums. That was the brush tail possum. Three out of 27 properties had wombats. Three out of the 27 properties had echidnas. Um, three out of the 27 properties um, captured lace monitors. And um, another three out of the 27 properties had ringtail possums. Um, one property recorded a bearded dragon, one property recorded a micro bat, and finally one property had a koala, not captured on camera, just for your information. The last graph um, shows the overall results of native birds that were captured on the cameras. Um, please note that our cameras weren't really set up to capture really any bird life, but it was nice to see that we had over 20 different species um, show up across the 27 properties. Um, one property had as many as seven um, bird species um, have their photo taken, and um, yeah, down to, I think there may have been three properties or four properties that um, no birds were actually captured on camera. So what I'm just um, running through now is um, a video that just collates a whole heap of photographic evidence of the vertebrae pests um, captured on across all the properties. Uh, it's worthwhile noting that this is just a handful of the representative photos. Um, 
So you may see your property come up with um, one of the vertebrae pests. As mentioned, at least one vertebrae pest was photographed on 92% of the properties. 70% of properties had European foxes captured on camera. So you'll see plenty of photos there of foxes just loitering around. 37% of properties had feral or stray cats captured on, on their cameras. 33% of properties had wild rabbits or hares. 'deer were captured on six of the six cameras set up in the Eagleton area. Wild dogs were captured on 11% of the properties. That's three out of the 27 properties. Only one um, site captured Indian miners. So I'm not sure um, for all those that are viewing whether you had any idea of what was actually um, what vertebrae pests or what animals you actually had on your property but um, it's a bit of a realisation um, when it comes down to like these photos and figuring out that um, You'll see a, a fox with, I'm not sure, hopefully it's just a rabbit in its mouth as opposed to a nice little native animal. Um, there's plenty of cat photos. Um, as mentioned, we took out any of the photos that had cats that had collars on, weren't included in these results. Only the ones that looked like they were stray or wild were included. Lots of wild dogs out in the Eagleton area. Um, it's a little bit scary. I wouldn't like to be caught um, out walking along any of those trails and being bailed up by some of those um, wild dogs. But um, you can definitely see that there are vertebrae pest issues in these peri-urban areas. Lots of deer um, on all of the properties out in the Eagleton area. Oops, sorry for that kangaroo photo in, in our pest photos. So lots of activity. And I'm, I was um, probably a little bit shocked at the, the high percentage of vertebrae pests out there. Um, considering that we only had one camera set in one small area um, on all the properties. Just the, the amount of activity out there is quite scary. And for all those um, people that own cats, um, it's um, interesting to note that um, there's plenty of cats that are out and about So quickly, um, I did cover most of these, this discussion as we watched those um, photos, but um, it is evident um, that there's a significant presence of pest animals and it's strongly apparent um, that peri-urban areas urgently require assistance in just managing, controlling and eliminating vertebrae pests, which will in turn just assist in protecting the native fauna out on our properties. Um, what I've done now is just summarised um, the results for your specific local area. So in the Gressford area, um, Gressford Torryburn area, on the four properties that we had um, the cameras on, there was um, foxes on every single camera out there. Um, 
There was also either a feral or stray cat or potentially a domestic cat that didn't have a collar that was out lurking around. Um, there were wild rabbits and or hares at two of the four properties. So that's a nice quick summary of what's actually happened out there. It's worthwhile noting that um, this just shows what species are out there. It, we didn't actually go through and calculate how many different foxes or dogs, etc., were on each individual property because um, the um, numbers of foxes and just trying to decipher whether it's the same fox or a different fox in the black and white night photos was too difficult. Um, this next graph um, illustrates the native fauna um, captured on the cameras. So, um, for um, the Gresford Torryburn area, um, kangaroos were kangaroos and wallabies were identified on 50% uh, of the properties. There were brush tail um, possums on three of the four properties. There was also plenty of native birds on three of the four properties. On one of the properties, there was um, a ringtail possum and also um, a bearded dragon on one of the properties. Um, so that's just a nice quick summary. Um, it's nice to know that there were up to five species um, on one particular property itself, so um, a nice um, variety there. The next graph basically um, summarises the native birds that were captured on the cameras on your property. Um, as mentioned before, the cameras weren't set up to capture birds, but um, these ones obviously wanted to get their photos taken. So um, we had up to three bird species on, on one camera, down to one um, on the Torrey Burn property. So this is just a quick um, video, just pulling the photos together for um, the East Gresford Torrey Burn area. So foxes, rabbits, hares, um, another fox, large hares, Um, a cat. Now this cat, I'm not sure whether it's wild or feral, but um, it didn't have a collar on. You can see that nice little fox. He's very handsome. He's got something in his mouth there. I'm hoping it's not a ringtail possum. I'm hoping it's just um, a rabbit. Um, we'll just run through the local native fauna that was collected on the cameras. So some nice possums. Wallabies, uh, I think that's a lace monitor on the right hand side, magpie, little echidna going for a, an adventure, I think that's um, a little duck there. I think these guys definitely knew there was a camera there and came in for a photo. Peewee. It was a really good photo of a black snake. Um, there's a little family of possums. Um, cockatoos. And I think that's just a quick wrap up of those native animals. So the recommendations that we came up just with um, as a result of combining all of the um, footage captured out in the field was that um, community education programs um, should be taken to assist peri-urban property owners to manage, control and eliminate vertebrate pests on their properties. We recommended that the programs include background information on vertebrate pests but also provide training and advice in methods and procedures to control, manage and eliminate these vertebrae pests out on their property. 
Um, we've suggested where possible um, a supply of material, equipment and traps to capture and remove vertebrae pests from properties. And um, in the instance of feral or wild cats or stray cats, we have recommended that HANA Local Land Services um, collaborate with local councils across the wider Hunter region to come up with a nice streamlined process for the capture and removal of these unwanted pests um, from our properties. So um, we've also suggested that in extreme cases, that is um, for wild dogs and deer in the Eagleton area, a collaborative approach program um, developed from or by the Hunter Local Land Services, local councils, state forests, larger landholders such as Hunter Water and the peri-urban property owners um, all collaborate together to come up with a unified program that's going to basically tackle these um, pests from a, a, wide, um, a wider area because um, they, they're clever, these um, wild dogs. They know what they're doing and um, um, some might be bait shy, um, some may be shy of traps. Um, they're um, highly intelligent um, animals, so a collaborative approach is, is really required. Um, oh, before we just go to questions and answers, I just um, uh, thought I'd just elaborate a little bit further on um, the cats um, that we have in, well, the, the number of wild or stray cats in our um, local areas. Um, it's interesting um, the number that came up. We, um, everyone has their, well, cat owners um, usually believe that, you know, their cats, um, when let out, because they're well fed, won't um, attack or capture or kill any native wildlife, purely because they're well behaved in the house, that they're well fed. Um, the unfortunate thing is um, cats have this natural instinct to prey and kill and um, even though they're well fed, uh, it doesn't deter them when they're out in the open, out in the environment, um, just to, to kill a bird or a cat, or um, kill a bird or a small mammal, um, native or otherwise, just because that's how, um, that's how they're wired. So if you've got um, a cat at home, it's really important um, to keep them inside, or if they do go outside, um, keep an eye on them and keep them, I suppose, contained to a particular area. Um, that's that's about um, um, all I've got to present on, um, but I'd just like to say thank you very much to all the property owners that allowed us to go out and set up um, the cameras and take the footage of these vertebrae pests. It's really evident um, with 92% of the properties actually capturing um, vertebrae pests on, on the cameras that there is definitely a problem out there. Um, we'll um, look to move to questions and answers. If um, you're interested in um, having an, a question answered, if you'd like to type away and send in those um, questions, I'm really happy to um, try and answer those questions as best I can. And um, Eva will be um, relaying those questions to me. So I'll um, leave you to type away if you've got any questions and I'll be back on in a few minutes um, once or if any questions come through. Thanks very much for your time.
So we do have a comment and a, uh, and a question. Uh, one from Fiona, um, a comment um, around positioning of cameras. She suggested that uh, door wedges are very good for positioning cameras. So that might be something that you could look at um, further down the track. Uh, Fiona also asks, um, not sure why uh, you are counting on domestic cats in your figures. Uh, thanks, Fiona. Thanks for the um, the tip on the the um, door wedges. I'll definitely look to use those. Um, so the domestic cats weren't actually included in our results. We'd actually removed those out of our results. Um, so any cat that had a collar um, or that we knew. Um, the property owners had a cat and were able to describe it or we met the cat um, initially. Those cats were excluded from our results. The 10 out of the um, 27 properties that did in actual fact have um, cats um, recorded were ones where um, we believed were either um, feral or stray. So domestic cats were definitely not included in those figures. Hopefully that. And, and uh, another question from, uh, from Jennifer. Uh, what were the best camera settings uh, to get clear photos at night time? Uh, thanks, Jenny, for that question. Um, look, all of the cameras um, all came back with good results um, on the night time, for night time. Um, the settings uh, that we had the cameras um, positioned at, we had um, various cameras set at either just for photo, um, for photo and or video, and um, the results were, were good um, on all the cameras that we established out in the field. And, um and just one more, and one more question: uh, Were any ethics approvals required? Um, thanks for that question. Um, look, ethics. Um, uh, I think all just came down to the agreement between Hunter Local Land Services um, with the property owner um, to sign off on saying that we had permission to um, enter the property and set up the camera. No animals were injured or otherwise in the program. And um, um, yeah, so the ethics, I think, all just came down to the agreement between Hunter Local Land Services and the property owners themselves. And that's, yeah, no more questions. Um. So we can move on to the next presentation. Thanks very much for um, participating in this um, live presentation. I hope that these results um, were informative. And once again, thanks so very much for all the property owners allowing um, myself and our company to come out and set up the cameras. Um, I'm now going to um, hand over and Kyra from Hunter Local Land Services is going to just present um, some information relating to programs um, that are occurring in and around your area that you might like to participate in. Thanks very much.
Hi everyone, I'm Kyra O'Brien from Hunter Local Land Services, Biosecurity Officer based at Tokau. Um, no doubt you just enjoyed Rosie's um, presentation, um, very interesting results that we've got there. So what I'm going to do now is talk about some um, general information in regards to pest animal management in New South Wales and the Hunter, and also give a bit of detail more relevant for the Torryburn area. So under the Biosecurity Act 2015, biosecurity is a shared responsibility where government, industry and the people of New South Wales work together to protect the economy, environment and community from the impact of pest species. Public and private land managers all have a shared and equal responsibility to eliminate and minimise biosecurity risks across land in New South Wales. Regional strategic management plans have been developed across all local land service regions to encourage engagement and participation across all land tenures, to enhance the participation and for coordinated pest management activities for improved outcomes across local areas. Government plays a key role in coordination and regulation for pest management under the legislative framework. In the pest animal space, New South Wales DPI have a lead role in managing terrestrial and freshwater aquatic pest incursions. Local land services supports the delivery of pest animal management activities and also play a regulatory role. A key aspect of the New South Wales Biosecurity Act is a general biosecurity duty. Any person who deals with biosecurity matter or a carrier and who knows or ought reasonably to know the biosecurity risk posed or likely to be posed by the biosecurity matter, carrier or dealing has a biosecurity duty to ensure that so far as is reasonably practicable, the biosecurity risk is prevented, eliminated or minimised. So what does this mean? Any person who owns, occupies land or undertakes a business which interacts with any plant, animals or soil should know the impact of working in that space and take all reasonable actions to prevent, eliminate or minimise this, these impacts. When talking about pest animals, this means you have a duty to control pest animals so the risk they pose is prevented, eliminated or minimised. Under the New South Wales Biosecurity Act 2015, pest animals are not defined by species. That is, pest species can be considered as any species that present a biosecurity threat. The Biosecurity Regulation 2017 outlines any mandatory measures for pest animal management in New South Wales. An example is, it is illegal for a person to keep, move or release a feral pig, wild rabbit, feral deer or European red fox. General control and management of pest animals are outlined in regional pest plans, like the, one to, the Hunter one pictured here. Following recommendations outlined in these plans, uh, outlined, these plans can then be considered mechanisms for individuals to discharge their general biosecurity duty and landholders and community members should work with stakeholders identified for ongoing implementation of pest animal management. The control methods, what I'm going to talk about now are some of the control methods that we actually use. So the first one that we look at is 1080 usage. So sodium phyllacetate 1080 is used to poison pests in Australia. In New South Wales, 1080 is registered for use to control wild dogs, foxes, rabbits and feral pigs. The usage of 1080 is controlled by, in New South Wales by a pesticide control order which sets out all the fine details of its usage. The next few slides I'll be, taking, I'll be talking about are control op options for some animals as well. It is important to note that we are talking about a poison and it can have negative effects if not used correctly. Before using the 1080 a person must undertake training to know how to use it correctly and LLS staff undertake risk assessments and put in place me measures to reduce the risk of off-target poisoning. Things LLS staff must take into account are distance to neighbours' properties and dwellings, distance to towns and built-up areas, the nature of the surrounding area that is where, where, 
That is, are we looking at a very rural landscape or are we looking at a very peri-urban landscape with lots of small land holdings? After considering these aspects, the LLS staff with the landholder undertake a risk assessment to determine the ability to use or not to use 1080. In my role, I receive a lot of comments of birds and goannas being killed by wild dogs and foxes baiting 1080. I believe a lot of this is misinformation and as the studies undertaken have shown, the amount of baits required to harm these types of animals is higher than they should be able to access or, eat or to be able to fit in their stomach. We get a lot of um, inquiries about goannas. People are really worried about goannas, but as you'll see in the table, it actually takes 93 fox baits to kill a goanna. Um, now, with our restrictions around 1080, there would be no landholders that would get 93 fox baits in the Torridon East Gresford area. A broad scale 1080 but ground baiting program already occurs in and around the Torryburn and East Gresford area during autumn and spring. The autumn ground baiting program normally is um, in May, which coincides with our aerial baiting program. Another form of control is trapping. There are a lot of considerations around trapping. So trapping is very labour intensive and you really need to know how to set foothold traps correctly to ensure trap shyness does not occur. Trapping using cage traps for some areas is the only option. There are some tips and tricks which can be used to lure the animals into the cage. It is successful if, if used correctly. At the end of last year, um, I was involved, well, and it's still happening, um, there is a program at Mount Breckham, just um, near Basie, um, at the moment, we have six um, monitoring cameras up in and uh, like on top and down lower at Mount Brecon. We trapped in there for a period of around three weeks in around about November last year and we caught, now I can't remember if it was five to six dogs um, and a fox. Um, we then um, pulled the traps up and then we looked at the cameras at the end of February um, just gone and there had only been a very, very like, low number of dogs and foxes in that area. But then we checked them again a couple of weeks later in March and it actually had started to ramp up again. We went back in two weeks ago to put traps in um, and we put the traps in and then we got all the rain and then I got bogged on top of Mount Brecon and we had to pull them up. So we are now waiting for it to dry up um, and as soon as we can we will get back in there. We did actually have predation on sheep um, along Basie Road um, two weeks ago. We put traps in and we actually caught a big dog there at that time. So um, yeah, so there is quite a lot of work being done in and around the Torryburn area um, and East Gresford area with baiting and trapping. Um, so which is, yeah, which is really, really like real, they've been really great programs. So another option for your control is shooting. Um, now obviously with shooting there are a lot of restrictions around it. You know, you obviously have to have um, skilled operators um, with the appropriate licences, you need to make sure that the firearm that is being used is the right calibre to complete the shoot. Um, shooting, if you, if you do happen to you know, trap a dog or a fox in a cage or a, or a foothold trap um, that you have set, you need to be able to, de to destroy that animal humanely. Um, and obviously if it's in a built up area, um, re you really need to discuss, you know, firearms with police and, and that sort of thing if you are going to be going out shooting. So as we know, um, wild dogs are present in and around the Torryburn East Gresford area. Um, so under the strategic, under the plan, the strategic objectives for wild dogs are to reduce the negative impact of wild dogs on stock and landholders, utilising best practice, Ensure that all the areas of the region are covered by best practice wild dog management plans and serviced by effective cross-tenure coordination. Support the landholders to undertake coordinated control, ensuring landholders are accredited to use 1080 and provide effective tra training on effective control methods. And we also support the dingo conservation and management in identified conservation reserves. 
So as a land holder, to be able to achieve this, you could participate in coordinated pest control, control programs that incorporate both primary and supplementary pest control. Report any wild dog activity to your neighbours and your local biosecurity officer. This reporting can also be done on the app Feral Scan. Ensure that any food sources such as carcasses, offals, food scraps are properly disposed of and ensure that your own pet and working dogs remain on your property. So the same, it's pretty much the same for foxes. Um, so we do know obviously that there are foxes in and around the area. Um, so you still have you know, the same reduce the negative impacts of foxes on stock. Um, support the landholders. So we support the landholders to get them trained up to be able to, to participate in the control programs. And then develop long term programs. So our, our ground baiting programs and aerial baiting program is something that we do every year. Um, even with COVID-19 this year, it is still going ahead. So, you know, that is something that is, is always there. Um, I actually had um, a, another landholder from Torrey Burn ring me yesterday who wants to be part of that ground baiting program. So what we concentrate on is um, the larger areas in and around Torrey Burn and East Gresford and not the actual like, township of Gresford and Torrey Burn itself. So as a landholder, once again, if you, with your foxes, um, to be able to um, achieve the outcomes of the plan, you, you know, if you can coordinate in the actual um, pest programs that we are having, report, report any activities to your neighbours or your local biosecurity officer. Once again, this can be done on feral scan and ensure that your food scraps and carcasses, offals are all disposed of. Um, food scraps are a big one with foxes. They like to get into garbage bins. So if you've got garbage bins out the front, make sure that they're, that, you know, or at the back, you know, make sure that they, they can't get into them. So this map shows the breakup of wild dog management plans across our hunter area. So it's broken up into nine areas and you can see there that there's one called Alan Patterson Williams. So that's the wild dog association that we actually conduct our um, aerial baiting and ground baiting programs that there's a huge amount of baiting that happens in that actual area. Um, these areas um, all have different um, pest problems. Um, some have you know more wild dog problems than others and some have more fox problems than others but these boundaries could form good areas for other pest man um, animal management groups to use as coordinated management areas. So the East Gresford Torriburn area really has a great one set up there already. Um, the meetings are often for the Wild Dog Association are usually held at either, we, they used to usually alternate it between Gresford and Dungal um, and once a year. So, you know, that's a great, great way to become involved as well. So with your control, we just sort of touched on control there. Um, going into it a little bit, you know, more, foxes and wild dogs will use the same control met methods. Um, Poison baiting, but poison baiting only if you can abide by the pesticide control order. So, you know, you can, you abide, you've got to be able to meet your distance restrictions. So five minute metres from your property boundary, 150 metres from your neighbour's dwelling. Um, trapping, so when we do trap, we use the soft jaw traps. Um, these are designed to hold the animal in place, but not provide any long term injuries. Um, off target animals can be released. Um, Cage traps are also an option, like I said before, but they don't perform as well. Cage traps are somewhat more reliable on foxes than dogs. They can be used by people who don't have experience with foothold traps and baiting is not an option due to the property location or distance restrictions. Um, Peter Raw will actually go through some trapping techniques and show you how to set a trap a little bit later on so you'll get a real idea of how important it is to be able you know, to know that you really need to know how to set a soft jaw trap. Trap. Once again, if you are interested in setting traps, we do run courses um, for landholders that we can put you through um, to get you to understand how to actually set a trap. So shooting, um, shooting. Once again, it's an opportunity stick or plan shooting is another tool, but you know it's not the greatest. Um, you really do, do need that skill set, and it, it is pretty hard to shoot a dog. Um, you know, running across a paddock. So you really got to know what you're doing there. So with your rabbits, once again, they come under the plan. Um, so the strategic at 
objectives for rabbits are to reduce the neg negative impact of rabbits on grazing land and biodiversity through a coordinated program to substantially reduce rabbit numbers in the long term and support landholders to meet their general biosecurity duty and utilise best practice control. So with the rabbits, um, you've got two options when with poisoning of rabbits. You've got 1080 or Pindone. Uh, 1080, we don't use much 1080 in this area for rabbit control. Uh, we use a lot of Pindone. Um, the reason being with the 1080, you've got to put it on carrots, feed it out. The risk to non-targets, um, you know, is huge. Um, and then you've also got the worry that if, you know, if all the carcasses weren't collected the next morning when the rabbits died and a domestic dog picked up the rabbit, you know, you'd have a, de a dead domestic dog. So we try to steer away from the 1080, um, go more with the Pindone. Um, the Pindone, normally you would look at a program, you need to do free feeding um, prior to a program. That could take you up to a week to get the rabbits eating the carrots. Then we treat the, rab the carrots with um, Pindone and the Pindone program you'd be looking at a week. So you'd, you'd bait three times during that next week. Another option would be the RHDV Khaleesi, which is the Khaleesi virus. Um, so it is also applied to carrots. Um, it only affects rabbits, so no other animals um, are affected with that. Um, the Khaleesi virus, though, the results are varied. Um, I often say if people want to go down the Khaleesi virus track, that we do the Khaleesi virus, but then we follow up with a, a good pin down program following it. The best way to get rid of rabbits is harbour destruction. Um, to gain any long-term benefit from controlling rabbits, their harbour needs to be destroyed. Um, this can be done by warrens being, um, being, um, being destroyed by ripping uh, with a backhoe or a bulldozer, or even if you've just got that pile of timber in the backyard, you know, you just need to burn it to get rid of it when you can. So there's also, sorry, I jumped too far. Sorry, there's also the options of fumigation. Um, fumigation is an option, but you really need to utilise a smoker if you're going to go down that path because you need to seal off all openings of the warren. Um, so, you know, it can be one of those things that, yeah, you, you've really got to make sure because if that, any of that gas leaks out, you, you don't have a successful program. And then once again, shooting, but it would be at, you know, at the end. So you do your, your baiting or your fumigation programs um, and then follow up with a shooting program. So with your feral cats, um, obviously there's quite a few feral cats in and around the area. Um, the, the plan, the strategic objectives are to reduce the negative impacts of feral cats on threatened species and support research into the effective control techniques and strategies for cats, including development of biological controls and non-lethal strategies, develop and resource long-term programs to reduce feral cat numbers below critical thresholds, to reduce impacts on biodiversity and threatened species. In the interim, effective cross-tenure control will focus on identification and control of cat breeding sites and peri-urban and urban areas to reduce risk to humans. Encourage responsible cat ownership and local government and companion animal controls. Support identification and awareness of key assets in the, in the region that are impacted by feral cats. Integrate feral cat management with management of other feral cat predators. So with your feral cats, they can be trapped using cage traps or soft draw traps. They can be shot. There is no poison registered in New South Wales for cats at this stage. When trapping and shooting cats, it is important to know, is it a feral cat? If you believe or have reason to believe it may be a domestic cat, you can take a caged cat to a vet or council for formal ID so the owner can be contacted. If you have destroyed a cat that has been threatening the life of another animal, then call the council for them to identify the owner. When considering a feral cat control program, please speak with your local council and a vet to make sure you know what to do. So the for formation of local groups and co-united joint ownership and control of the, of the pest animal problem will assist landholders to gain successful long-lasting results from their efforts. There is no need to start from scratch with groups 
look at what other groups are already active in your area. Pest species can be very mobile or so widely spread that the only way to actually target the pest and reduce its abundance is to control them across as much of the landscape as possible for as long as possible. Groups help to keep landholders active in managing their pest animals. Locals are getting locals involved instead of government staff trying to push for control. Groups help to streamline process. Lots of people receiving the same information all together versus individually. Group leaders act as drivers in the local community and help facilitate LLS staff. Groups working together also can reduce distance restrictions. I also feel having local groups making, makes baiting lower risk as the local area becomes fully aware of the problem and control their domestic animals accordingly. Feral scan can be utilised by groups, keep each other informed of control programs as well as sightings and impacts. Feral scan also acts as recorded keeping tools and informs LLS about sightings and impacts of pest animals. So there is, like I said, there is also, there is at the moment the Alan Patterson Williams Wild Dog Association that is already formed and an active group. Um, but then you've also got land care groups in the area as well. So, you know, maybe just becoming involved in either of those groups is a good way to start. Um, and, you know, at the land care meeting, maybe there could be a, a component on pest animals that, that you could all talk about. And if there is, you know, if we're seeing major problems, then you contact us and then we can get a, a control program out there. But like I said, it is a great little area um, that is working really well at the moment with the control programs that are happening. Um, and yeah, and please just, I, I can't stress enough, just keep us informed of what's going on. So if you do have a stock attack, let us know. Um, and then, yeah, we can, we can come out and, and try and help out. So if you've got any questions, if you want to just start typing away um, and yeah, I'll definitely try and help <laughs> to answer them. Uh, so uh, while we wait for uh, the questions to come in, I, I just have a question just around shooting. Um, uh, so what is the position on, on um, shooting uh, pest animals in peri-urban areas? I in peri-urban areas, I think it's a good idea to, um, I mean, obviously you are allowed to, you've got to make sure that you've got all your um, your licences, you know, and that sort of thing. But if it's in a really, you know, built up area, um, it's a good idea to talk to the police. Um, but obviously, if you know, if you've got a fox in your backyard and you, you can shoot on your own property, that's not a drama. But, um, you know, if, if you're going, yeah, if it, I just... You just need to make sure that you, you know what you're doing with your, with your firearms. And most people that do hold firearms, they should know what they're doing. Uh, okay, uh, there doesn't seem to be any questions coming in. So um, it sounds like you've, you've covered all the, the areas. Uh, so I'll probably go on to the next presentation now. Thanks everybody for your time. Um, and yeah, and I think the program's been great, especially the, the results that the Rosie has sort of put up. They've been, you know, really interesting. Um, but yeah, and just once again, if you've got any comment, comments or questions and you haven't got time to do it today, just give us a call here at the office. Thank you. Hi, my name's Peter Raw. Um, I'm here today to um, run you through um, some vertebrate pest control techniques. Um, so, types of pests and fauna, uh, the control methods, and a bit of a demonstration uh, with a few of the traps. So, the pest fauna we're looking at today are wild dogs, foxes, rabbits, hares, pigs, and deer. So the control methods we're going to run through are biological control uh, for rabbits. We've got Calicia virus and myxomatosis, 1080 baiting, 
which are amig baits, manufactured baits, ejector baits for dog, foxes, rabbits, hares and pigs. Uh, we also run through cage trapping uh, for pigs, foxes, dogs and cats. Soft jaw trapping for dogs, foxes, cats, rabbits and hares. Uh, shooting, pretty much all those animals, deer, dogs, foxes, rabbits, hares and pigs. And also mechanical control which um, which is ripping warrens. So the biological control um, Galicia virus um, for rabbit. Galicia virus disease is a viral disease uh, which affects only European rabbits and myxomatosis is a viral disease that affects rabbit population depending on weather conditions. Um, it's carried by mosquitoes so um, in those conditions yeah, it should, should uh, be effective. Um, with the 1080 baiting, uh, wild dog and foxes, so we've got notification three to 10 days before program commences um, by letter, email, phone call, or public notice. Um, site selection uh, for dog uh, would be uh, dog sightings, uh, tracks and trails. Um, in accordance with the pest control order. Uh, established bait sites, uh, check and re-establish bait sites weekly. Uh, collection of untaken baits uh, is pretty important to see you don't get any um, off-target kills. Uh, GPS location of all sites, so you can just demonstrate on um, where you've placed the baits and, um, and it's good for recording uh, the number of baits taken um, and what the baits were taken by. Um, this can be determined by um, trail cameras or also um, yeah, just the way the bait site has been disturbed. So if it's torn right apart, um, it's more than likely a dog. And if it's just a little hole in the side of the bait site, it's more or less a, a fox that's taken the bait. Um, 1080 baiting wild dogs and foxes, so it's, um, you need to be qualified to, to put out the baits, collect the baits from local land services. Um, you need a chem cert or your pin down 1080 uh, course. So follow the PCO, uh, limit of 10 baits per kilometre of trail or a maximum of 20 baits per 100 hectares. So notification, minimum three days, all properties within one kilometre of, of baiting. So it's important to inform your neighbours and local locals of what's going on. Uh, the distance from houses and habitats, so we've got five metres from boundaries, 50 metres from habitats, property owners, otherwise 150 metres from others, um, 10 metres from domestic water, water supply. So here are some photographs of um, some meat baits that have been injected by local land services. Um, the middle slide is um, some manufactured baits. It's already the 1080 inside. And the last is a ejector bait, uh, which mechanism, which um, it'll uh, in directly inject the, uh, the poison into the, the dog or fox when it um, pulls up on the bait. We'll demonstrate that in a minute. So these are some um, bait sites in the field. Um, there's some, normally you just hump the dirt up and put the bait in under the dirt and um, foxes and dogs will sniff that out and, and take that. And also there's an ejector that looking down from, a, from the top, there's a ejector bait which has um, been set up for, um, for dogs or foxes. So here's a video of me um, just at home setting up, just as demonstration purposes, setting up a um, ejector bait. So um, I'll just run this through and explain how it's done. So we just um, have the um, ejector mechanism. Um, you just slide it into a um, a device which sets your um, ejector 
Now that's just taken out. It's just a demonstration there of how it goes off. Yeah, so that um, yeah, slides down and, and locks in. Uh, once we have that um, in place, we, we hammer this pin into the ground which, um, which the ejector sits inside. So, um, yeah, depending on how hard the ground is, it's, um, it's normally not too bad to, to get in, but you don't want it coming out when a dog or a fox pulls up. Yeah, so we just make, make a little divot around to get the ejector in a little bit further. Um, just so we can, that's, a, that's our lure that um, the 1080 goes into, that screws on top of our ejector. It's important to have glasses and gloves on when we do this. Um, it's a, um, yeah, you don't want it going off in your face. So that's um, pretty well set in place now. There's no poison in there. So I'm just going to pull up on the top to demonstrate how it goes off poison will come out once the dog or fox pulls up. So they can be left in the ground for a fair while. Um, yeah, they're easy to install and remove. Once again by qualified people. Yeah. So now we're going to um, baiting rabbits, hares and pigs. So Similar techniques are used for, for the three animals. So, um, so we also need a notification again, three to 10 days uh, before program commences, um, either by letter or phone, calls, emails, public notices in accordance with the PCO, um, site selection. So we've got to choose a site where um, pigs or Rabbits or hares frequently um, visit or feed. Um, so once you find your site, establish a free feeding area where grain or carrots are put out for a number of days, five to seven days. Uh, so you calculate each day how much food the, um, the animal's been eating, or the animals, and then you uh, work out uh, once they've sort of um, come to a, once they stop sort of overeating and, and looking for more, you know, the, the, the numbers are pretty well right as far as the kilos. And um, yeah, so we GPS the location, um, poison the feed by LLS, uh, based on the kilos of free feed taken and establish the bait. Um, after the pigs have eaten or the rabbits have eaten the, the bait, uh, we collect the poison. Uh, poison animals, uneaten poison bait, and dispose of, uh, so we bury that, or take it to a waste depot. Document number of animals poison, kilos poison eaten and collected. So we get a, so now there's just a few photos there of um, putting out some grain for pigs. So the first photo shows um, the grain put, being put out. We actually put a bit of molasses on top just to trying to track them in. The second photo shows um, the bait site completely taken. And um, so that was re-established for about five or six days. And then this, the last photo shows the poison um, put out. And um, yeah, we got a pretty good result from, from that program. So cage trapping, I bought a cage trap in to demonstrate. Um, this is a cage trap for a a fox or a cat. Yeah, so basically um, they come in all different sizes. So this cage trap is designed for a, mainly a cat, probably a small fox. Um, so it's simply set up by um, opening that door putting the, the lock in there and then putting feet at the back of the, the trap so that um, when the when the dog uh, the fox or the um, 
cat puts its foot on there, the door, the door will shut just like that. So, uh, and then the animal's disposed of humanely. Um, so yeah, we've got to establish these traps in a shaded or sheltered area. Um, they're, bit, they're to be checked daily, preferably in the morning. Um, and then yeah, euth euthanized humanely. Uh, the trap can be reset or put on a different location, depending on the number of cats or um, foxes you have around. And it's always important to try and keep any human scent off the, uh, the cage. Uh, so give them a good clean in between traps and use gloves. So there's a few uh, photos there, similar to one we've got here on, on site. So we've got the cage trap and then the second slide we've got um, two kittens in the, or three kittens in the trap. Now those kittens actually went to a good home. Uh, they were relocated through, um, through the council. So um, cage trapping, targeting pigs. So again, site selection. We need to um, make sure we're picking a site where the animals frequently visit, similar to the, the baiting, 1080 baiting. Um, so set up the trap. Um, we actually free feed in the trap uh, for a few days and we have like cameras on those traps so we know how many pigs are coming and going. And when we think we've got all the number of pigs going in and out of the trap, uh, the trap's set, so it'll go off when the pigs go in. And um, yeah, once pigs, one, once they're customised to entering and leaving the trap, uh, so check the trap daily and euthanise pigs humanely. So again, uh, those pigs don't need to go to a waste depot, but um, dispose of those in a, in a, in a pit or a so you can bury them. There's just a few photos of a, of a cage trap for pigs. There's a few different ones on the market, but these ones you can actually build at home. They're a bit of work. Um, and then the second photo obviously shows um, pigs being caught. Yeah, so there are um, a couple of photos. Um, so soft jaw trapping is another technique uh, for wild dogs and foxes. So again, we've got to select a site, um, appropriate site based on you know sightings and um, tracks and monitoring. Um, so established traps. You, you also want to put them in a shade, like a sheltered area, if possible. So we GPS the area and um, and check them preferably early morning. So and then once a dog or a fox is caught in those traps, we euthanise them humanely and uh, reset the trap either in a similar spot or, um, or in another area depending on numbers. So this is a, um, this is a typical uh, dog trap or a fox trap that, um, that we brought in today to show you. Um, there's a fair bit of work in um, setting up a trap. Uh, you can't just buy one off the shelf. Uh, the traps need to be set up properly and people that use them really need to be trained. Uh, there's a fair bit in them. So we've got um, a few photos here, one of um, a, a trap being set. So obviously the, the trap's in the ground, they're buried under the ground, the dirt's put back over the top. So you can't see the trap once it's in there, they've got to be fully camouflaged. And then there's a few photos there of the trap going off, that's actually two different locations. And this is uh, a slide I'll show you just of a little bit of uh, work we do in preparing traps for sites. There's, um, this is boiling the traps, so in between baiting, uh, trapping, we've got to um, boil the traps so that they're st oh, not sterile, but so that there's no scent on them. And also there's wax in there as well, which um, lubricates the, um, the trap itself. So we, we put the trap in and, um, and boil it for 10 or 15 minutes, depending on the condition of the trap. And, um, and then they're just set aside to dry and they're pretty much ready to go for the next time. Uh, this next slide shows um, setting a trap. So we try not to disturb the area as little as possible. So we just set the trap first and just make sure it's working properly. Uh, we'll find out, put it in place, see how it looks. 
and again this is not this is not where we're, where I'd set a trap but um, it's just for demonstration purposes so once you have your trap sort of set you sit it on the ground to see where it's sitting and how it's sitting um, put it aside you know, scrape any debris off the top put that aside because that'll go on last when we dig out any dirt we need to dig out and it goes into a sieve uh, we sieve the dirt back on later so once we um, <coughs> get to the required depth we um, place the trap in so it's important we don't disturb the area um, the traps are normally pegged down so we put two, two fairly big pegs inside the um, underneath the trap to hold the, the trap in place once once a dog's caught because they do um, struggle obviously to try and get out once they're caught so you don't want to lose a, lose a trap or a dog once you've caught it. Um, yeah so I'll pop the trap back in the, in the hole I won't peg it down for this um, demonstration but you can also tie it to a, a tree or a post and um, also put on a drag so the drag will slow the dog down it won't go too far or fox for that matter and the same process uh, for, for catching rabbits as well so there's a fair bit of work involved um, just in setting a trap so yeah that's probably going to be just about done so once, uh, once all the dirt's in, we don't want any rocks going in because that can, um, can catch, catch on the jaws and release the, uh, the dog. Yeah, so we just level it off, keep it, keep it sort of normal level, like on ground level. Um, I haven't worried about dressing it up too much with um, leaves or grass or bits and pieces because um, it's in an area where there's pretty much dirt anyway so you want to keep it sort of how it was and I'll set this trap off in a minute um, I've got a pressure gauge that we use to, to set the trap uh, to check whether the trap will go off and normally it's around about two pound of pressure on that gauge which is about the pressure of a, a dog or a fox and you want a bit lighter pressure if it's a rabbit or a cat so that's about it for the dog um, so in any program um, yes we don't always get every animal so um, we go through afterwards and, and do a shoot so and you might just want to do a shoot as a initial program if there's if you know there's only one or two problem dogs or um, deer or rabbits so um, yeah obviously require a firearm license and also neighbours uh, notification of neighbours and also the police and mechanical so there's mechanical ways we can keep out unwanted vermin so we've got um, ripping rabbit warrens so uh, that'll disrupt the, um, the life cycle of the rabbits and um, it's just another add-on to what uh, we all already have in place also uh, real f also fencing so we can also fence out rabbits dogs foxes whatever you, you want to fence out um, can be quite expensive um, just depends on you know the, the amount of area you've got to cover and also how valuable your, your livestock are. Um, that's about it for today. I hope you found it interesting and um, thanks very much. Hi, it's just Rosemary um, back in the question and answer seat. Um, I'm sitting here on behalf of Peter, who my husband, who just presented um, some of the techniques used for um, controlling or um, eliminating pest animals. So um, I believe there may be a question. Um, I'll just 
um, hand over to Eva to read that one out to me. Uh, yes, I've got a question from Jennifer. Uh, how often do you get off target species with foot trapping and what sorts of animals? Thanks, Jennifer. Um, that's a good question. Look, with the trapping, the soft jaw trapping that our company undertakes, um, we haven't really had too many off target. Um, I mean, we're usually setting the traps for wild dogs and foxes. Um, I suppose the only off target animals that we've um, ever captured have actually been wild or feral cats. We we haven't intentionally set them to, to capture the wild or feral cats, um, but uh, only as recently as um, two weeks ago, um, uh, Peter um, captured a, a wild cat in one of the traps that he'd um, set up for wild dogs and foxes um, out on a client site. So, um, yeah, in answer to your question, we've caught wild cats or feral cats, um, but basically you need a pretty good um, pound of pressure. Um, uh, it's around the two pound that actually um, sets off those um, soft jaw traps. Um, a regular question that we get asked is, you know, if a domestic dog um, gets caught in the trap, um, you know, what will happen to it? Um, the short answer to that question is your dog will have a really sore foot um, for a couple of days, um, maybe up to a week. Um, the soft jaw trap shouldn't break any bones, but there will be soft tissue injury. Um, they um, recover um, quickly from th um, those injuries and, yeah, um, are back to normal probably within two weeks, you know, a month at the most. So um, the other thing is if any other um, animals are um, captured in traps, um, those soft jaw traps really only do soft tissue damage and, um, you know, once released should heal um, quickly as a result of um, being captured in the trap. Hopefully that's answered your question, Fiona. So there are uh, no further questions that I can see in the chat box. So I think we can uh, wrap up the presentations. Um, thanks very much for um, listening, listening and participating. Hopefully um, the presentations have been useful and a little educational. I'll finish up now, um, but before I go, um, once again, thanks very much for all those property owners that um, opened up their properties for our company to come and set up cameras and um, capture images of native and um, pest species on, on those properties. Um, it was really enjoyable to do and um, the results were, well, even a quite a shock to me, even though I work in, in the industry with the 92% um, of properties um, having at least one vertebrae pest was, um, yeah, more than I expected. Um, hope you and your families keep healthy, safe and well in this COVID period and just enjoy your beautiful properties in this time of isolating and social distancing. I'll finish up now, but Eva will be back on just to wrap up the, the um, presentation. Thanks very much.
Hello, I'd just like to uh, wrap up the workshops and say uh, thank you very much for joining our live stream workshops. Um, uh, uh, this is our second workshop, work, work, workshop um, in a series of, of um, a total of four workshops for for Wildlife Come and Monitoring Program. And I especially like to thank uh, all the landholders who participated in the three month monitoring program. Uh, the results uh, really um, provided an insight into what is actually happening on, on the ground um, in regards to feral animals. And this will help inform um, management, uh, appropriate and targeted uh, feral animal control and management. Uh, so thank you again. And uh, if you would, are interested in forming a, a group, uh, a feral animal control group, uh, please contact uh, myself or Kyra O'Brien um, for more information or if you would like any further technical support or, um, or training support. Thank you again.